out there in the dark. Thank you again for uh, checking in. So the cotton gin and the theory of relativity. Stick with me, I think you'll find this somewhat interesting. So we all know that Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin in the late 1700s. Um, it did not make him rich. Uh, unfortunately for Mr. Whitney, uh, even though he had a patent on the cotton gin, it was easily replicated, slight changes, and uh, it went around the world so very, very fast. It changed, obviously, the world, but it did not make him a ton of dough. But in 1794 or 1798, Mr. Whitney is working on an idea of interchangeable parts for rifles, um, which really, really intrigued the U.S. government because we're, we're getting pretty close to uh, going to war with France, which was actually from 1798 to, I think, 1800. And our government was very interested in this concept of interchangeable parts for rifles, being able to repair them quickly, et cetera, et cetera. Well, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Whitney was about eight years too late because he didn't get his interchangeable rifles going until about 1806. And as I mentioned earlier, the war had ended by 1800. But about the same time, early 1800s, this other cat named Eli Terry, now he's working on uh, uh, clocks, shelf clocks, or mantle clocks as we call them today. And he was actually um, uh, the very first person to sort of mass produce uh, shelf clocks. And all of his clocks had wooden gears. Uh, take a look. Here's some wooden gears on a clock. So the problem with wooden gears is uh, in moisture, they tend to swell and in dry areas, they tend to shrink. So it's very, very problematic, but he's, he's able to make these gears uh, relatively simply and, and sells a fair number of clocks. Now he has an apprentice named Chauncey Jerome and in 1822 or so, well, Mr. Jerome, he sets up his own a shop and starts making clocks of his own. But instead of using wood gears, he's using metal stamped out gears, uh, which really changes clocks because now you don't have to worry about humidity, dryness, etc., etc. And to be able to stamp out a metal gear is a hell of a lot cheaper than carving a wood gear. Uh, he's also responsible for what was known as the one day clock. Uh, meaning it only had to be wound once a day, which just revolutionized everything. By 1837, he was selling more clocks than anybody else on the planet. Um, I think in 1850, he had sold over 400,000 clocks. 400,000 clocks! Uh, take a look, here's a clock with some metal gears. Right? Okay, now in 1855, uh, Chauncey Jerome buys the Bridgeport Clock Company, which is actually owned by P.T. Barnum. Uh, yes, that P.T. Barnum. Take a look, here's a picture. Now this guy is a complete scoundrel. I mean, he's, he's actually a horrible, horrible human being. Um, and essentially, when uh, Mr. Jerome buys the Bridgeport Clock Company, I, I, one of the problems with making clocks that work too well is they last too long and demand for clocks drops about the time he's buying the P.T. Barnes Clock Company. Long story short, it all kind of goes to hell in a handbasket and Chauncey Jerome uh, dies broke penniless. And I mentioned P.T. Barnum uh, because about the same time, 1850 or so, he has convinced this lady named Jenny Lynn, an opera singer. Take a look, here's a picture of her. Now she's known as the Swedish Nightingale. Supposedly, she had the most beautiful voice anyone has ever heard at any time, anywhere, any place. Unfortunately, she died before uh, we figured out how to record sound. 
So there's no recordings of her singing anywhere. But she's known as the greatest operatic singer of all time. Well, P.T. Barnum convinces this gal to come out of retirement and come to America, and he's gonna pay her $1,000 a show and wants to do like 150 shows. Well, she basically agrees and, and she's gonna come across here to America. Now, even though P.T. Barnum is a complete scoundrel, he is a marketing genius. Um, he starts slapping her name on anything and everything, even clocks. Take a look, this is a Jenny Ling clock that belongs uh, to my parents. He has to do this, of course, because in America, no one's really heard of Jenny Lynn, and when they hear Swedish uh, Nightingale, they think it's a bird. So he has to spend a tremendous amount of money, not only promoting her, but getting people to understand that she is actually uh, an opera singer. And I believe I read that uh, he was getting close to $600 a ticket for certain engagements for her. $600, that's in the 1850s. That's a tremendous sum of money in 1850. Well, by, by 1851 or so, she's had enough of P.T. Barnum, and she kind of bells in America and goes back home. Now, about the same time, uh, 1850, there's this cat named Humphrey Davy who's working on an arc light or an arc lamp. And, and really, the light produced um, from one of these, these lamps is still the brightest light we've ever been able to create. And... and Long story short, what it basically is a couple of metal electrodes that when they're put a certain distance apart in a bulb uh, that's filled with gas, acetylene, acetylene, when it ignites, it creates that arc between the two metal electrodes. Well, part of the problem is, is those electrodes burn and they begin to pull away as, as they're burning, you lose the arc light. Well, this cat named Leon uh, Foku, um, uh, he takes a regulator or a gear out of a clock and puts it in the bulb, which keeps those two electrodes from moving because as they burn, the gears sort of keep it uh, together. Changes everything. But, but that's not really even what folk who is necessarily famous for. Um, he has his, there's a famous uh, folk who pendulum that was actually in the Pantheon in Paris. And it, it really, it's, it's direct evidence of the Earth's rotation and really the first time that, that um, uh, Copernicus theory is proved true that the Earth rotates. Uh, take a look, here's a couple of pictures of uh, Foku's pendulum. Now, as amazing as that is, and, and earth-changing as that is, one of the other things that Foku does is takes uh, those gears and puts it in telescopes. Because if the earth is traveling at a thousand miles, or rotating at a, a thousand miles per hour, you look up through a telescope at a star, it doesn't take too long before it's moved out of your field of vision. So when he puts a gear in, now it allows that telescope to turn as the earth turns. It changes everything, which now allows us uh, to take photos using the dagger type image, which is just an early photograph of things like the sun. And we're able to prove or determine that those aren't mountains on the sun, but they're sunspots, uh, things of that nature. And, and it sort of changes everything um, we know about the sky at that time, all about 1851. So uh, going back to Jenny Lynn now, about 1847, before she meets P.T. Barnum and comes to America, she's working with this cat named Giuseppe Verdi, and he's written an opera for her called I Mas Nadiri, um, and it wasn't a terrible success except for the fact that Miss Lynn was singing in the uh, opera, which, which made it a success. But the reason I mentioned Verdi is because his most famous opera, Aida, um, 
was actually commissioned by Egypt's uh, uh, Khedive uh, to try to celebrate the opening of the Suez Canal. Now, typical of Giuseppe Verdi, he was a little late. Uh, the opera didn't premiere until like 1871, and the canal was being built from, I think, 1859 to 1869. And the Suez Canal um, uh, was basically the credit for the idea uh, has always been given to a, a guy named uh, Ferdinand Dulesses. Dulesses. Um, but several other people have claimed credit, uh, at least for the idea of the Suez Canal. One of whom, <coughs> his name is um, uh, Henry Saint-Simon, or Henri, I guess, but Henry Saint-Simon. This guy's whacked completely out of his skull. I mean, he, he actually shot himself in the head six times and lived. I don't know why he shot himself. He, and how you can shoot yourself in the head six times is absolutely beyond me. But some of the things that he, he had thought of, uh, as, along with trying to take credit for the Suez Canal, which he had nothing to do with, um, was he, he came up with um, uh, Catholicism for business people. And he also came up with this uh, kind of totally new scientific view of history. Now, one of the guys that did think that Saint-Simon was a genius is this guy named August uh, uh, Comet. Now, August Comet, uh, he sort of took that idea of, of uh, scientific history and he creates three stages. The first stage would be uh, uh, theolo theological, second stage would be metaphysical, and the third stage would be scientific. Now, in the first stage, that theological, um, everything is because gods and spirits, um, uh, you know, flower gods, sea gods, tree gods, etc., etc. The metaphysical is we've moved along some, and, and we have steam engines, we have electricity, uh, we have things of that nature, and, and things that we still can't, we still struggle with, we credit to God. No more spirits, just a God. And then the third stage would be scientific, where there's no gods, everything just has a rational explanation, um, a, 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 a rational explanation of how everything fits together. Nothing is missed. Well, he basically calls that concept, that scientific concept, uh, sociology. Because if everything fits together, just like people, um, the science of human behavior and how it affects them. He's so popular that Brazil, when, once Brazil frees itself, the, the flag that still flies today, um, the, the words that are emblazoned across it are order and progress, which is something that uh, Comp used to speak about. Now, one of the guys that kind of thought Comp's uh, this three-stage uh, history or three-stages theory, especially that third theory about science and that everything is sort of interconnected and you you you. You can't study one thing without studying everything, is a guy named uh, Ernst Mach. Now, Ernst Mach, he took those ideas, and in 1895, he developed what was called the Mach Principle. And basically, his, his thought or argument was, for example, uh, Newton's apple. You know, you drop Newton's apple, and it falls, proves gravity works or exists. Well, his argument or discussion is, well, it, it's not actually falling directly down because the earth is spinning and rotating around the sun. So it has to, even though it's following, falling, we see it as falling directly down, it's actually not. It's actually falling like this because the earth is spinning, getting back to Foucault's uh, pendulum back and forth and the, as, as the earth spins. So he, he, his, his principle is basically saying that everything is affected by everything else. Is, is the sort of the short answer to all of that. And he becomes an incredible influence on this cat named Albert Einstein. Now take a look, here's a couple of pictures of Saint-Simon, uh, Comte, um, Mach, and Albert Einstein. And by the way, uh, in case you were wondering, Ernst Mach, he's most famous for the ratio of speed to sound. Basically, he was the cat that figured out 
once you travel faster than sound, you, uh, you hear the pop, blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, Mach 1, Mach 2 is, is named for this fellow. Anyway, take a look. Here's some pictures of it. So Einstein, he takes Mach's, uh, this idea that everything, everything is affected by everything else and assumes that light must also be affected. Well, in 1919, um, it's a year of an eclipse, Einstein and some of his pals, they go down to uh, Princess Island, which is, I think, uh, off the Africa coast somewhere. And it's where there's going to actually be a total eclipse. Well, they take a picture of the night sky before the eclipse. Um, and then they, of course, take a picture of uh, the night sky during the eclipse. And when they, when they get back, they discover something. Uh, there's a couple of stars, very faint in one photo, and then uh, very faint in the eclipse photo. Now, they're super, super small, so they blow it up, I don't know, three or four hundred times. And what they notice is uh, those two little stars move ever so slightly in the two pictures. And, and the one with the eclipse, um, it basically what they're able to determine without boring you to death is that the, the, the power of the sun's gravity actually bent light. That's why the stars appeared to move. They didn't move, it was just an appearance because light was actually uh, bent by the power of Earth's gravity, which helped Einstein develop his theory of relativity, changing everything that we know today. Now, isn't that amazing? From the cotton gin to E equals MC squared. That is absolutely amazing. Cotton gin, Theory of Relativity. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Um, as always, look some of these guys up. Uh, Eli Whitney is interesting. Uh, Chauncey Jerome, very, very interesting. Uh, Jenny Lynn, uh, again, her voice was never been recorded, so I don't know if she's the greatest of all, but for our purposes, greatest of all time. Um, spend some time uh, looking up Humphrey Davy and... Uh, Actually, uh, Dagger, the early early photographs and stuff, his work with uh, with chrome and, and mercury and the various things to get pictures is absolutely fascinating. And Leon uh, 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 Foku, he's worth a moment of your time. Not so much San Simon, he seems a bit like a, a, a nut job, but probably focusing most on, on Ernst Mach and, and him taking uh, Comp's theories of essentially with his sociology and the study of everything uh, to that next level. Uh, again, it was very, very interesting to me. But, but do your own investigations. It'll lead you down some amazing paths um, through history, um, e even the arc light and, and acetylene. I mean, that, that's welding, um, how we weld ships. There's, there's, a, there's a ton of directions it can take you in, and I think you'll get a kick out of it. But anyway, uh, in this world, when you could be anything you want to be, be kind, be humble, be forgiving, and be melting snow. Bye-bye.